On my way back to Hong Kong in 1978, I stopped off at Calcutta in order to revisit the little railway colony of Kanchapara, where my father had been a locomotive engineer and we'd spent the war years. I'd last seen it when I was eight years old. Just a few miles beyond the railway, we made out a familiar building, the Railway Institute, rising as incongruous as a Greco-Roman temple from the agricultural flatlands. We found the gate closed, patrolled by a trio of youths brandishing bamboo staves. Alongside was a sign announcing the annual district sports day of North 24 Paganas. I tried to gain admission, but the youths shook their head. Cannot institute close today, they said. To my rescue came a charming young woman who asked if she could be of assistance. As I explained the purpose of my visit, her eyes widened and her smile expanded until she positively beamed. How very interesting, she murmured. Please come with me and permit me to introduce you to our chairman. I used to work under your father, said the chairman. He was a rather glum man, not easy to get along with. He kept very much to himself. That sounds very much like my father, I agreed. He did not appear to find it particularly surprising that, not having seen Kantrapara since the age of eight, I should now wish to return. Will you join us? We are about to open the event, he said. He led the way into the marquee where, as I assumed, I would be shown a seat in the audience. Instead, I was conducted on stage to join the dozen or so dignitaries seated there. I felt extremely awkward and out of place. The chairman approached the microphone and delivered his speech in Hindi, at the end of which he mentioned my name and turned to indicate that I was to take his place. Overcome with embarrassment and stage fright, I saw that it was not only <clears throat> rude but positively discourteous to ignore the summons and quite possibly this was his test that he had imposed to avenge himself the sins of my father. Composing myself as best I could I replaced him at the microphone, thanked him for the introduction and embarked on a rambling disjointed explanation of how I came to be there. I had spent my childhood in Kanchapara, I explained and it had left such a mark upon me that I had long since felt the urge to return. The honour I had been accorded through this in invitation to join in their sports day would now contribute a further highlight to my store of memories. I scanned their blank faces. What a load of old bullock carts they must have been thinking. The close of my impromptu remarks was followed by a brief interval and then a scattering of polite applause that slowly swelled in volume. I returned to my folding chair and sat out the rest of the proceedings, following which we retired outdoors for tea and sandwiches. I apologised to the chairman for the clumsiness of my remarks and for having left the audience in some state of confusion. They were surely bewildered as to why I had been permitted to gatecrash their sports day. Not at all, he replied. They were most impressed that we had gone to the considerable expense of bringing you here as a VIP to grace our opening ceremonies. In fact, we'd be delighted if you could do this again next year. Turning the discussion to the Institute itself, I asked why they had chosen to erect their marquee on its grounds, rather than stage the ceremony in that building's considerably larger auditorium. The chairman explained that the Institute had fallen into disuse, except on very special occasions it was generally kept locked. However, he could arrange to have it open for my inspection, should I wish. I took him up on this offer, and as soon as I could decently withdraw from the gathering, I accompanied the caretaker delegated to unlock the Institute doors. When they swung open, I was admitted into a high vaulted gloom, to which my eyes required some time to adjust. A musty smell of stale, trapped air pervaded that cavernous darkness. I could make out the stage to the right and a long procession of chairs lined against the walls. 
The stark reality was suddenly overlaid by images of past occasions, Christmas parties, costume balls, variety concerts and cinema matinees. The contrast was so great that I dispelled them from my mind, thinking, not now, later, when I can afford to give them the anguish that they have brought forth. But I couldn't shut out the voices, reaching me as if travelling great distances underwater, lapping on the shores of memory like a foam on an unbidden tide. I moved on to the billiard room, where my father had spent so many evenings with his friends, particularly those fleeting friends he had made with servicemen passing through the, during the war. Dust sheets were laid across the tables, and cobwebs suspended from overhanging lamps swelled in the unfamiliar current of air. I thought for a moment I could see in that stagnant air the faint threads of cigarette smoke that had once clouded the room and imparted its special atmosphere. The realisation struck me with painful clarity. The Bell Institute had become a mausoleum to a period of time that had no relevance, no bearing on the kind of occasion I had just witnessed in its grounds. So much had happened in the thirty years and more since I last saw it that I should have ex not have expected otherwise. The wonder was that it should be there at all, preserved as an ungainly memorial to film former folly, a temporary aberration in India's ongoing history that spanned millennia rather than centuries. The people who built it to enshrine their own fleeting rituals had disappeared like the lost tribes of Egypt, like so many other civilizations that have left their tantalizing traces in fallen monoliths and jungle ruins. We Anglo-Indians had become an endangered species, our heritage steadily eroded until it must inevitably disappear into oblivion. Thank you.